recognize the significance of the dish with funds for incumbent to this land and offer our respect to our, our Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis neighbors as we strive to strengthen our relationships with them. So thank you all for coming. My name is Byron Sheldrick, and I'm the Associate Dean Academic for the College of Social and Applied Human Sciences. And I'm going to stand somewhere where I hope I'm close to a mic. Um, no, it's uh, And uh, welcome. This is the third Lunch and Learn in this year's series that are being sponsored by the Hub for Teaching and Learning Excellence in the College of Social and Applied Human Sciences. And I'm very happy uh, today that we're, uh, we're having a session on uh, trends in strategic evaluation. And we have a great panel here uh, who have all sorts of insights on, on the topic. And hopefully we can have a variety of takeaways and, and, and think about how these questions of evaluation relate to our teaching in a variety of ways. I'm not going to introduce the entire panel, but instead I'm going to uh, welcome uh, Mary Granskoop, who's the uh, Kinross Chair in Environmental Governance at the University of Guelph, uh, housed in the Department of Geography, Environment, and Geomatics. And I'm very careful to remember the full name of the department. And there's a comma in there, changed. too. There is. <laughs> An Oxford comma, hopefully. No. Um, and so, well, there should be then. Uh, never mind. Let's not get into that debate. The whole hour will be lost. Uh, so Mary has, uh, I'm not going to read Mary's CV or her entire bio, uh, but she has an impressive record of working in a variety of contexts related to the environment, sustainability, uh, working with indigenous peoples, um, both in government and the, the nonprofit, non-governmental sector, and a lot of her research and work is around uh, partnerships and, and the, the possibilities of partnerships in terms of promoting uh, significant environmental change and sustainability and so we're very fortunate to have Mary with us this semester as the Kinross Chair um, and also here to uh, lead us through this discussion so I'll turn it over to Mary. Thank you Byron, you're too kind. Uh, yes, call myself a proud generalist, instructor problem browser, etc, etc. So, um, I am not a practitioner in evaluation. I am an observer and an admirer of evaluation well done. Um, so we have a wonderful panel here today and uh, to talk to us really about the opportunity that evaluation presents and the trends. And when we were brainstorming as a group, um, and, and the group being uh, the department, uh, Geography, Environment, and Geomatics, uh, CESI, the Community Engaged Scholarship Institute, and the, the Hub for Teaching and Learning. We were brainstorming as a small team about organizing this. We were talking about, well, evaluation from drudgery to opportunity. So, you know, this is not about the checking the boxes. This is really about strategic and uh, opening up the window what's happening in the EU and elsewhere uh, around, uh, around the trends and kind of with a message that it's coming to a neighborhood near you, you know, for a lot of the research community and uh, kind of getting ready, uh, uh, you know, readiness for this. I'm sure many of you are already experiencing this, uh, this shift and, and stronger rising emphasis um, in the practice. Uh, so what I'd like to do first is uh, introduce uh, Liz Jackson, who's gonna moderate the, the discussion, the conversation here today. So Liz is the director of the of CESI, the Community Engaged Scholarship Institute here on campus. Uh, in this role, Liz builds uh, on her research and teaching expertise in collaboration, community-engaged research, and interdisciplinary approaches to social justice. So CESI really is all about, I'm sure many of you are familiar with CESI, but uh, for those who aren't, uh, fosters meaningful engagement and partnerships across faculty, students, and the broader community. So we welcome and thank you, Liz. Um, and our next speaker, uh, Andrew Taylor, uh, co-owns Taylor Newbury Consulting here in town and is an evalua evaluation consultant and trainer with over 25 years of experience in the field. He is a Guelph alumni and PhD in psychology and is now an adjunct professor in the department. Andrew's a frequent commentator about uh, the trends I've been mentioning uh, amongst uh, uh, grant-making institutions 
and he's also a researcher with the Harwood Institute in Washington, D.C. Um, thank you, Andrew. Um, our third panelist, Leanne Sutherland, another Guelph alumna, alumni, <laughs> was raised on her family's farm here in Ontario, moved to the UK to do her PhD on, on, the, soci on the sociology of agriculture and state. Uh, she is now a research leader at the James Hutton Institute in Aberdeen, Scotland, where she guides a science team focused on environmental decision making, sustainability, and social justice within the agriculture sector. She is with us now as a visiting professor sponsored by the Arel Food Institute, housed at Geography and uh, um, SESI as well, under the SESI umbrella. So welcome everyone, and um, Andrew, uh, well Liz, take it away. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be moderating a brief discussion, well actually a fulsome discussion after each panelist has a chance to present. So the format today is kind of structured, uh, structured. so the first half of our time will be short contributions from each panelist. And then we'll use our last 20 to 30 minutes having a moderated discussion. I brought a few questions that I think will help weave together these really diverse perspectives on evaluation practice. Um, and we're going to make sure to leave room for questions from you in the room as well. I think we have a really robust range of orientations on the panel and in the room from the work I know that some of you do. So some people here want to talk about evaluation curriculum and its impacts. Some people want to talk about evaluation of social practice. Some people want to talk about research excellence in the sciences and other disciplines. So my job is going to be to try to make that feel like a woven together thing rather than weird prickly things. So you can tell me in the end how I did. <laughs> All right, so Andrew, I think you're going to speak first. Sure, so but before we get into the panel, uh, hold on. Um, Mary asked me to sort of frame up the theme a little bit and what we're discussing, which perhaps gives me an unfair advantage when it comes to the panel discussion. I don't know, but we'll we'll, we'll take it from there. And uh, I, so I just I'd not to comment so much about my work, but sort of why we chose this topic. And and I think. You know, program evaluation really is simply the sort of systematic analysis of information using all of the skills we have in our social science toolbox, but for the purpose of checking to see whether a particular intervention is working, checking to see how a particular intervention in the world can be made better. So the audience is different than it is for academic research, and the purpose is different. We're really very strongly action focused. So in some respects, like I feel like program evaluation is. The practice of program evaluation is quintessentially community-engaged scholarship. It aspires to take everything we know and apply it to learning about action in the real world. And, and along the way, the interesting thing is that you end up needing a whole sort of other set of skills besides the social research skills. You need to be a bit of a facilitator and a bit of a uh, you know, a bit of a knowledge mobilizer and know a little bit about sort of management and organizational theory and all that kind of thing. So it ends up being an interesting what one of the founders of the field calls a sort of a meta discipline. You know, where, where you're sort of synthesizing a bunch of different skill sets. And so I think that appeals to a lot of us as well on our learning journeys around the idea that we're bringing together multiple skill sets. Um, I think that the practice of evaluation is growing. It's something that lots of organizations are interested in, that government is interested in as far as we know. There's a budget uh, statement today by the provincial government, maybe they're not anymore, I don't know, but, but, they, but the, generally speaking, there's a lot of a lot of interest in it. And I think that it's evolving in a couple of different ways at the same time. And I sort of feel like our discussion today comes at a point where evaluation is perhaps at a bit of a crossroads. On the one hand, I think there is a push that concerns me towards uh, evaluation as a tool of sort of risk management, social control, and accountability. Right? So we will only give money to folks that know for sure they're going to make a difference. And even when we do give money to people, we will make them you know, check back with us to prove that they've made a difference, and that's how we'll make sure. And so you see things like, um, like, like sort of um, pay for success investment from grant makers sometimes, right? Where, where they say we'll only give out the money once you've shown that you've made a difference. And, and I think that creates a situation where uh, it, it's tough to really be sort of thoughtful and critical about what you're learning because so much is riding on getting positive answers, right, from, from your evaluation. At the same time, I think, evaluation is also potentially growing in the exact opposite direction or in a much more exciting and interesting direction, I think, where people are starting to see that this is a process not just of sort of measurement and keeping track, but a process of, of sort of deep critical reflection, learning, a mechanism to sort of pull those who have not traditionally had voice into the process of deciding whether this has been a good intervention, whether it should continue, whether it should go on. So there's exciting new developments in, uh, you know, indigenous approaches 
approaches to evaluation. There's exciting new approaches in, in kind of critical learning and its, and, and its approaches to evaluation. And, and I think all of that faces us when we're evaluating social programs for sure, but I think it also comes up here on campus, right? When we're, when we're asked to determine whether our programs are preparing students for the work world or whether our SHRC grants, uh, sometimes people now have to do evaluations of their research projects to see if those research projects helped people. And, and one kind of analogy that sort of crystallized this crossroads for me is think about, you know, the McLean's Magazine University rankings? Right? Kind of an evaluation, you could argue. Right? Like it's an effort to sort of see which programs are effective and which programs are not. And you could say at one level, that's great, right? Increases transparency. You know, parents and, and high school students use it to make more evidence-based decisions about a program that will meet their needs and so on. But at the same time, those of us who work at universities might, I know, sometimes feel like, What's being measured there? And are the right things being measured there? And does the McLean's University ranking draw us into a deeper conversation about what university education should be? Or does McLean's University rankings cause us to sort of shut down, sort of keep our heads down, and try to look good on the indicators so that nothing goes wrong? And, and I think that's sort of the crux in some ways of, the, of the, the inflection point I think we find ourselves on. And that's what I'd hope to like to, to talk about today is how do we as a university move things in, you know, in one direction in a deeper, more thoughtful understanding of how evaluation can help with change and, and sort of perhaps resist that trend towards a more, uh, a, a, you know, more sort of control-oriented approach to evaluation. Do let me know if you can't hear me. I don't know how well the microphone will pick up my voice. I must admit, when I first was invited by Mary to participate in this, I thought, oh, <laughs> okay, because evaluation isn't, doesn't have a kind of strong critical discourse, or at least not in the world that I work in over in Europe. But when we got talking about, so, you know, what, what is evaluation and what are the key issues here, then it quickly became apparent that measuring impact was a big part of that. And that is certainly something that is changing a lot, and I've seen it over my 13 years at the James Hutton Institute. And so I'm going to talk a bit about my world at the James Hutton Institute and how my research is evaluated internally, and then I'm going to talk a bit about the European Commission and how they evaluate their projects, because that's where a lot of my research is located. And I'm going to talk a very little bit about the UK research excellence framework that the universities have to adhere to. So the James Hutton Institute, where I work, is one of Scottish government's major research providers. But although we have 350 scientists, we're not actually a degree-granting body. I actually have the luxury of doing full-time research. So we're evaluated separately from the university system. So my group, so I'm in the Social Economic and Geographical Sciences group, which is about 10% of the scientists at the Hutton, which is pretty great. It's a critical mass of people who are really interested in doing research that will be helpful to the agricultural sector and in the environment more broadly, both in Scotland and around the world. So every five years, we have an evaluation process, and we're actually just going through it right now. So on my to-do list, I need to come up with my list of publications, which is pretty standard. So they'll go through and they'll have a look at, you know, are these, you know, four-star journals or three-star journals or impact factors, and there's a lot of argument about whether we should do impact factors or journal rankings by discipline, and I'm not sure what the dynamics are here, but I'm sure there's probably some of the same arguments that go on. But what I think is particularly important for us today is that the other piece I need to do is to write up my impact story. And so what I'm going to tell you about is this impact story that I need to write. And what that is, is something that I've done in the last five years that's had an impact on the people I work with. And so because I work in agriculture, it's the agricultural sector. And so what I'm going to write up is my impact story, is my work on Scottish Government's Women in Agriculture Task Force. And so how the story goes is that a few years ago there was a call come out from Scottish government, so separate to our core funding from them, which is about 60% of where we get our money, asking for women, asking for research on women in the agricultural sector. And I looked at that and I thought, yeah, that's something that's going to have impact. And the reason I thought this is because Scottish government has a 50-50 by 2020 agenda. And what that means is that they're seeking to get equal gender representation on the boards of all public bodies 
including those that are elected. So the National Farmers Union of Scotland, which is a different thing from the National Farmers Union here in Ontario, it is actually our mainstream primary agricultural union, has no women on the board, have never had women on the board. So there's definitely an underrepresentation going on there. So I knew when we took on this piece of research, which frankly was pretty underfunded in terms of what they were asking us to do, that this was likely to have an impact. And the interesting thing about it was that we brought in Sally Shortall. So Professor Shortall is um, a known gender expert on women in agriculture, but she's done her work primarily in Northern Ireland, and she's recently moved to Newcastle. And she came on board the research team largely for free because there was <laughs> because professors are expensive and there wasn't a lot of money in the project. And the reason she did that was because she knew it would make a good research case study for impact for her evaluation within the research evaluation exercise that the UK universities go through. So for them, they need to have two impact stories within a five-year period. And it actually, the research evaluation exercise, because we're outside of it, I just heard little pieces. But what I understand is that it essentially comes up with a ranking for different departments. And the higher you are ranked, the more money you get from the UK government. So it is critical to universities in the UK that they score highly, and that's not just scientific impact, they have to have this more practitioner impact at the same time. So what my story will talk about is not just that I'm on a task force, isn't that lovely, but what the task force is doing. So we're instituting training for women, so leadership training to try and get them so that they are higher profile, enable them to run successful campaigns because you people aren't appointed to the boards of agricultural organizations, they're elected. And to get elected, you need to have a high profile, you need to have, run a campaign, you need for people to think that you're a credible candidate. You don't, nobody wants to be on a board because of who they are or what their background is. They want to do it on the basis of merit. And clearly we have a lot of women of high merit in Scottish agriculture. We just need them to be perceived that way. We're also offering some certification or a charter for agricultural organizations, so not just um, farms, but farms are included, other agricultural organization industries representatives so that they can look at their institution and go, how are we doing? And not just in terms of gender, but a range of other issues. So are we, how are we handling our maternity leaves? How are we providing education and, you know, development? How are we progressing people and their careers? So not just women, but younger people, employees in the farming operation, for instance. And we've seen it have some impacts outside of actually what we're doing on the task force in that our National Farmers Union, for instance, has looked at this and realized the, the, the publicity that they're getting on the back of this and gone, right, we're going to have a separate survey of our members to see what we can do to try and integrate women. We're going to change our membership so it's not just person-based, it's household-based. So when they invite people to meetings, for instance, are not just inviting the one person who's a member, which frankly is typically the oldest male in the household, they're inviting other men, so younger people, successors, as well as women in the farming operation. So this is a fantastic kind of impact story that we get to tell. And in part, it's motivated by us knowing as scientists, not just that we want to do high impact things, but that actually we're being evaluated on it as well. So I'm getting close to the end of my time, I'm sure, because I get excited, but I want to talk a little bit about the European Commission funding. And I'm, one of my roles here at Guelph is to try and connect Guelph people to the Hutton, but also to UK and Europe more broadly. So if you want to know more about European research funding, do come talk to me afterwards. But what I'm going to say now is that the grading schemes for research proposals have stayed the same. So they're graded out of 15. You get five points for your scientific excellence. You get five points for your impact, which is the kind of stuff I was just talking about. And you get five points for implementation, which is just how feasible it is. And 10 years ago, when I was starting to write my first proposals, it was really all about the science. And for the impact part, you could get away with, okay, well, we'll have a website and we'll have a final conference and maybe we'll have some stakeholder advisory groups and tick those boxes and then you're good. And that is no longer good enough. The European Commission has instituted a different way of managing these proposals and a different way of evaluating them. And they've done it largely by integrating stakeholder organizations. So when you're forming a consortium for a lot of the calls, they specifically ask for a multi-actor perspective, which means that you need to integrate, in my case, 
agricultural organizations, so farmer organizations, advisory services, but equally if you're responding to an environmental call, maybe environmental NGOs, that sort of thing, into your actual consortium. Then the actual proposal is evaluated not just by scientists, but also by representatives of industry groups. They've also instituted a process of review during the project. So it used to be that you wrote your proposal, you wrote your um, deliverables and you sent them in and nobody really looked at them so you spent all your time on your scientific publications. That doesn't float anymore because 18 months and then you're going to have an evaluation that looks at your Twitter feed, that looks at your communication strategy, that looks at who's been engaging in your different focus groups and they will come back to you and say, you know what, actually you need to work on that or actually that's not good enough. So they're enforcing impact in a different way because you don't get your money for the second round of funding because they'll split it up until you've demonstrated that you've met these targets. So that's been a massive change in European Commission funding over the last 10 years. And I think it's been interesting because it was your comment I liked, Andrew, about is it just kind of box ticking because you can still box tick it? And I do still get people coming to me saying, can you please just give me some generic stuff to put in my impact section so I can get the marks because I really want to focus on the science. And it's changing the way that we think because that's not possible. You have to develop your impact strategy in line with your science to think about what makes sense and who are my stakeholders and that sort of thing. So it has actually changed the way that we do the science. And I think it has actually increased the impact that we're having within the agricultural sector. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk as an observer as, rather than a practitioner, which I mentioned before, and, and go back to experience that I had inside government watching the whole focus around the discipline of evaluation and reviewing of programs and building in outcomes and doing that more strategically and the kind of genesis, the emergence of that, and, and where, just comment on where, um, where I think the field is headed now. Um, so I was in the Prime Minister's office in the, er in the early 2000s, and what happened then is that healthcare funding was taking more than 50% of all of government's available funds. So, uh, you know, more than 50 cents on every dollar, every tax dollar was going to healthcare. And we crossed that and it's climbing now. And uh, the same trend, of course, in the provinces. So that was really a wake up call to governments around reduced uh, capacity to support social programs and all the other priorities across government. And at the same time, there was an emergence. And, and you know, it's interesting how Commonwealth governments look to each other for uh, innovation guidance, you know, what's new. Um, and so the links to Australia and the UK are very strong. Um, and there was a brilliant innovator within the cabinet office in Tony Blair's government that was bringing some really new thinking with new branding around it as well, around how you'd be more strategic around program design, outcomes, review, how you build that in at the front end, and it's not just a uh, you know, uh, a um, cost-saving exercise where all the senior deputy ministers get together and they do trade-offs because that's how it's been done in the past. It's building in strategic evaluation, often done by external experts, um, into the whole program review pr process. So that was quite some time ago. And then we had the Harper <coughs> years around accountability. Uh, really tightening that up and strengthening of Treasury Board. Now we have a very senior unit uh, attached right to the Prime Minister's office around strategic evaluation and called Deliverology. So it's the mantra of Deliverology across the Trudeau government and they're only beginning really to uh, to look at, you know, what does that mean across the government. Now I'm not an expert in the granting councils um, what the trends are happening there, but I just, you know, I, I look at the field. I look at, for instance, the largest charitable foundations in the world, some of them who I've worked with, um, and what they're doing around evaluation. So I have right here, and I'll pass it around, the 11-page evaluation policy of the Belinda and the, and the Bill and Melinda um, Gates Foundation, so they're the largest in the world. They, um, they, they have about $5 billion a year in charitable giving for a whole variety of causes. Um, very interesting. Um, another one is the Pew Charitable Trusts, and I was a contractor to them for a decade. Um, I've been inside that 
tent around their approach to impact evaluation. It's extremely rigorous. So here's a, uh, an evaluation brief. Oh, I handed out the wrong one. That's the Pew um, Trust <laughs> policy note on evaluation to, uh, to decision makers. And this is the Gates 11-page um, evaluation policy. So there are many others. There's the Hewlett Foundation. They give about $400 million a year, as does Pew. Uh, in Canada, the mantra around being strategic with uh, evaluation you know, is really uh, alive. Uh, the McConnells, the Westons, RBC, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, it's very much a trend. And, uh, you know, partly it's about, I mean, the spirit of, uh, you know, we do this session. It's really to talk about, you know, getting ready. Uh, what do you do as a university? What do you do as individuals? What are you facing? What are you experiencing? And um, so that's really what I have to offer here today. And I also wanted to introduce a video that, uh, of an interview we did with an uh, uh, Australian uh, consultant working with a very innovative group called Social Ventures Australia. Um, they are doing some fascinating work around uh, what they call the ecosystem of evaluation, uh, evaluating the social return on investment, uh, with fascinating metrics um, that are actually being that, that are very influential influential within the Australian social financing context, and their focus really is on thriving communities. Uh, but they've done some really groundbreaking work with indigenous programs uh, in Australia to the point where now the um, uh, the government has asked them to be engaged in reviewing all of their indigenous funding, which uh, I think they have some heartburn about. Um, and, uh, but the fact that they're being invited is very interesting. And they also have many, many investors. So they've now turned into an investment house for impact investing in, uh, in community resiliency. Um, so I, it's, I just uh, thought it was interesting to interview um, Brendan Ferguson, their consultant, just about what they're experiencing, and it's just more food for thought. Thank you. Think about Social Ventures Australia, and what is your role there? Yeah, um, you touched on it a little bit in terms of who SBA is and what we do. So we're a non-profit organisation, and as you said, Ray, we're, we're working towards an Australia where all people and humans can thrive. Our role is as an intermediary. So the way in which we're able to do that is typically by supporting our partners to improve the efficiency or effectiveness of you know, the all-purpose sector. Uh, the, the functions that we have within our organisation are uh, venture philanthropy, impact investing, consulting, policy and advocacy. So venture philanthropy is sort of our replicated the venture capital model in a philanthropic context. We take grant funding um, and apply that to organisations that we think have the uh, potential to scale and uh, achieve better outcomes. Uh, impact investing, kind of a bunch of ex-bankers doing social finance deals. So that's more about returnable capital, uh, but where we're able to generate both social and financial returns. Consulting, we're management consultants. Um, uh, but working in the non-profit sector, which informs the work that we do. Uh, it's typically in the strategy or outcomes management work. Uh, and then we have a policy and advocacy arm which sort of came along more recently where we recognise that we, we learn some stuff through our, our various other functions and, and we need to use that to inform our perspective on what works and, and what should change to improve outcomes um, across the country. Um, so I think as you said, you, know, you asked what's unique about SVA, I think the collection of those offerings under the one roof is probably certainly unique in Australia. Um, and, and we sort of sit at the intersection of government, private funders and community service organisations. Um, that's what attracted me to SVA. And you mentioned that I work in the consulting team done a little bit of work in the policy and advocacy team also around 
thinking through the drivers of better outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, so that's our First Nations peoples. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I mean, you've you asked um, how evidence-based innovation drives short and long-term outcomes. Um, I don't know specifically about the Canadian context, but I suspect that it's similar in that there's an awful lot of things being funded by government in particular that are not achieving their intended outcomes. Um, in Australia, we spend about six billion a year on Indigenous specific programs and services, um, and the outcomes really aren't proving. Um, that's a broad statement, but for the most part, it holds true. Um, and that's a small cohort of our population as well. We're talking about 700,000 people or so. Um, so I guess if, this is simplistic again, but I draw a line on this just that that speaks to the need for innovation. How do we do things differently? Um, but that innovation needs to be driven by or informed by evidence of what works. Um, otherwise, we're just continuing to spend money and we're not shifting the dial. So uh, yeah, we talked a little bit about already about Indigenous people, Indigenous programs. Uh, there's a wide set, a widespread consensus in Australia that very few programs and services are achieving positive outcomes. One exception to that is Indigenous Land and Sea Management, where we've had the opportunity to be involved both with service providers and with governments. Um, and one of the reasons that those programs are successful is that they connect people back to their country and culture. And so engagement amongst Indigenous people across Australia is extremely strong. And there's a broader range of community and individual outcomes that have been achieved through that work. And SBA and others have been working over probably the last decade or so on building the evidence base um, for the success of those programs. So I think that's now relatively well accepted in Australia. We've also seen that Australia, the Australian experience of Indigenous land and sea management has helped to inform the the broader adoption of the Guardian program in Canada, as I understand it. Um, so uh, I suppose that's one specific example of a whole lot of work's gone into trying to understand what outcomes are being achieved and whether a particular program is successful, and then using that to, to help to scale uh, that program and achieve more outcomes for more people across. And one of the ventures that we've incubated recently internally is something called Evidence for Learning, where we sought to replicate some of the stuff that's going on in the UK around What Works Network. So we're trying through Evidence for Learning to build an understanding of the evidence base uh, and then share and use that evidence. Um, and in particular, we're concerned with translating evidence that is being created um, into a digestible form so that it can actually be practically used by teachers in the classroom. Um, so I think rather than focusing specifically just on evaluation, that whole evidence ecosystem, uh, the way it works, the way it informs practice, I think is, is really important. Evaluation is one element of that, um, and that sort of typically speaks to uh, you know, point in time, independent, uh, evaluation um, where you know, an objective party might seek to understand whether a particular program is efficient or effective. Uh, but I also think it's really important for us to be thinking about the way in which service providers and others within the ecosystem are collecting the information that they need to prove and improve uh, what they're doing. And so I sort of speak to uh, the need for outcomes management as we often refer to it, uh, by service providers on the ground. So I think what I'm trying to say is that everyone kind of has a role to play in building our understanding of what works and helping to inform you know, how we how we spend our money to achieve better outcomes for people. We have one last um, contribution from Andrew and then we're going to open the floor for conversation. Great. So, so tell a story of, of a project I've been working on over the last few years with a group called the Ontario Nonprofit Network. So they are a, an umbrella group that does advocacy on behalf of the, um, for the public benefit sector or the nonprofit sector. 
And a few years ago, they, they kept asking their members, what are the issues we should be working on, what should we be doing? And the members kept saying, evaluation. You know, we need to be working on evaluation. And, and, and so we started a project on it where we started exploring what are the perceptions of evaluation practice among those in the nonprofit sector. And we also talked to government and we talked to United Ways, we talked to other funders about it. And we learned that the practice of evaluation in principle, everyone agrees that it can be very powerful, that it can lead to a lot of learning, that it's an incredibly useful way of kind of making our practice more evidence-based, more innovative, of moving forward, but that it, it, it often fails to deliver on that promise. And, and in particular, it fails to deliver on that promise when it gets bound up with accountability, right? Where, where in order to continue to get your resources, in order to continue to get your support, you have to, um, or at least the perception is, you know, that you have to sort of look look good on your your your, um, your your impact stories or your number of publications or, or whatever it might be. And and this, I remember one interview in particular where a nonprofit said to me, "Our evaluation findings are the offering we put outside the gates of the village for the dragon to eat, so that the dragon, <laughs> so that the dragon goes away and doesn't burn down our village, right?" Yeah. And, and so yeah, it speaks to sort of how little ownership there was over that process, right? Like, you say you guys want this, I, for some reason you guys like this crap, so here you go, please go away and leave us alone kind of thing. And, and we did a bit of a lit review on the factors that make evaluation meaningful and useful. Mm. And, and, and interestingly, they have very little to do with how big the sample is, how fancy the methodology is, whether it's randomized, whether it's controlled. The things that predict the usefulness of evaluation are buy-in, our clarity of purpose, our environment of trust, our ongoing communication between the stakeholders that are involved, and so on. And, and so we started talking about what could we do in our project to try to sort of uh, address that and and in a way I think part of what happens and, and it'd be interesting I'm interested to ask my fellow panelists about this is that because they both told stories of, of evaluations kind of you know really working well and and to what degree they would say that it was those kind of relationship factors those interpersonal factors trust you know communication and so on that really greased the wheels and made it work because because I think we all of us especially uh, those of us who've grown up in kind of a Western European tradition have this tendency to intellectualize Right, this tendency to focus on the ideas on the page and the bullet points and, and, and treat things like machines. And, and so we, we do evaluation in that way. And, and you know, I heard you know, in a, with this sort of, sort of perverse situation where funders are asking nonprofits for this evaluation. The, evaluate, the nonprofits don't find it terribly useful, but they send it in. And then the funders don't find it terribly useful either. It's kind of a half-assed system that doesn't really do anything good for anybody, but we all keep doing more and more of it every year. And I'm reminded of that old quotation around, you know, an accumulation of facts is no more a science than a heap of stones is a house. You know, we keep more stones on the pile, more data on the pile, and it's not turning into evidence or insight. And, and I, I think the bottom line for me is, and I suspect it's probably true in these stories we've heard, and it's certainly true in my story, is that we can't let the learning, you know, the, the culture of learning um, and insight and action be sort of accidental. I think we have to design for it. We, we have to have evaluation systems that are explicitly set up to ensure that there is learning. And the one way we've sometimes talked about it is, let's not talk about measurement first. And then once the, and this is the one sort of, um, Nit, I might pick with your colleague from Australia, is he talked about once we've got evidence, then we can take action. Mm -hmm. And I think what I've been learning is until we have trust and clarity and shared purpose, mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot of point in gathering evidence, mm -hmm. right? That, that in some ways that sense of, of actionability, that sense of the right stakeholder buy-in has to come before mm -hmm. the gathering of data. And, and I'm just, just to know if that's true, because I think, you, you know, as, as sort of a, a use, you know, you're sort of a, a, a recipient of an evaluation framework, Leanne, mm -hmm. right? As, a, as a, you know, you're being asked to share this data, but mm -hmm. I think it's data you more or less see as meaningful and relevant and, and sort of appropriate to the work that you do, right? It's not something imposed on you from the outside. It's, it's sort of... No, because we've written the proposal, so we've already identified what it is we think would be useful indicators. Right. And so if you do it properly, then you think through on the basis of right. what we're proposing to do, how can we ensure that it has an impact, or how can we ensure the stakeholders are involved in that? And then we report back on what we propose to do. Right. I mean, obviously, we do still have scientists who think, well, you know, what do I have to do to take this box? And so they will right. just sometimes take what somebody else has come up with and gone, right, well, we must, we must need a website, and we must need a national stakeholder consultative right. group, and we must 
and then how much lip service it is to actually, you know, we can, we can report that we've had these meetings and we can report minutes and we can even report outcomes, but are the outcomes from the meeting or are they what the scientists wanted to do anyway and manage to, you know, talk to the stakeholders right. about it and then kind of rubber stamp. So, and it's interesting when you're talking about this kind of learning process because I think certainly the European approach has really changed how scientists come at it, but I'm not entirely convinced that it's helping Europe learn how to run better projects or hmm. how to manage projects better. Right. So I wouldn't say that it's, I mean, it did get a fairly positive picture of it, and certainly 10 years ago, we were putting our deliverables on the shelf and nobody was paying any attention, and that has changed, and that is great, mm -hmm. but I don't think we're there yet in terms right. of what you're talking about. Okay. Because there's no, yes, you won't get your money, but that you can apply for the next project without any insight from whether your previous one was successful or had impact or didn't. So, so, you, so you don't know what happens to these impact stories when you send them up to government? Like, you don't know what government does with them? I think they just use them to hang on their walls as nice pictures or right. to put in the newspaper as things that we've done or... So your interior decorators. Yeah. <laughs> slash PR. Yeah. Right. The posters on the wall. It, nice. Yeah. yeah. It's a bit facetious, but I don't think... Yeah. It, it may affect the next funding program. Or our current funding for Scottish government, for instance, is a five-year program, but what really matters is your midterm review. Because they've already committed to the next five-year program long before you finish the first one. Right. And so they, the midterm review is actually much more important than the final review. Right. Andrew, did you have closing comments? No, I'm, I'm good. Okay. I like a panel that runs itself. I feel like I'm just going to be like <laughs> the weird table at the wedding where no one's really sure why that person's there. <laughs> um, so I circulated in advance of this discussion um, a series of questions, some of which I think all of you have already touched upon in your presentation, so I'm not going to belabor it. Um, if I may, I'd like to ask one question to the panel and then turn to the room. You're, are you waiting to ask questions at this point? Kate is. Okay, so I just wanted to ask my, the, the last question that I prepared, um, trying to bring together all these worlds of thinking and approaches uh, into the kind of university environment where a lot of us are, are employed and studying. So um, I'm really curious to hear a little bit more about the role of community in the models of evaluation that you have witnessed as most impactful. So conventional scholarly models certainly position um, researchers as experts and communities as places of need, right? Mm -hmm. Or instructors as experts and students as these <laughs> voids in need of filling up with, with expertise. So I'm not hearing that in your presentations, but I'm very interested to hear about ways in which you have worked or witnessed others working to uh, work against those kind of harmful and wrong-headed assumptions in terms of building evaluation practices that work to uh, as knowledge sharing and to level out authority and power. Anyone want to take that one? Well, I'll comment on a practice that I wouldn't suggest. <laughs> Back to your trust sure. question is, yeah. um, you know, I was engaged in a multi-year, multi-million dollar um, initiative around land conservation in Canada involving many, many, many people. And um, the funders brought in an independent evaluator to evaluate the program. Um, which was never shared with us. Mm. So back to your question around trust, all we heard was a one-liner that it was great, <laughs> you know? And, um, uh, you know, back to your comment on trust is that having uh, transparency around results, um, I think is pretty fundamental. I just find it really interesting what you said about the funder because kind of the, the elephant in the room is who gets funding and who doesn't for these yeah. you know, research projects. And even though we're involving stakeholders in our consortiums and so therefore they have a budget, they will be the only team in that country that has the budget. So when they're trying to then engage their peers in what's going on, they have the budget and the control and ultimately they're responsible for reporting. So it's really hard to try and to try and pass too much responsibility to people who aren't being paid when you are actually being paid mm -hmm. to do the work. And so there's that whole kind of dynamic that's really tricky to work with. And the European Commission, quite understandably, doesn't want us paying people who, over whom they have no control mm -hmm. to work on the project. So by definition, they become kind of volunteers. Wow. Andrew, did you want to uh, yeah, Building on that in terms of um, uh, what's a model of evaluation practice to your, to your original question that 
that mindfully brings in voice. I, I, I thought I would, one little example, like, and it's a local example, but I think it illustrates a really important principle is there's a, an entity in Guelph called the Guelph Neighborhood Support Coalition that came to be because funders in town, the United Way and the city principally, realized that their approach to giving funding for neighborhood work in town was a little ad hoc. Mm -hmm. Like one neighborhood would get recreation money, another one would get money for a community center, and it wasn't very fair. And so what they did is they created this arm's length entity which is an independent nonprofit organization with a board of directors. And the members of the board are, at least last time I checked, half of them were uh, representatives of neighborhood associations, and half of them were representatives of important funders and large nonprofit organizations in town, like public health and, and folks like that. And the whole idea is that that independent entity is the one trying to bring together a thoughtful, critical approach to evaluation of what's going on in neighborhood groups. And the funders are simply members of it. Like they aren't calling the shots, they aren't requiring it, they aren't doing it. They're bringing money to the table and certainly they want to invest their money in an evidence-based way, but they don't have control over the evaluation process. It is an independent process. And I, and I, I like that model. And, and I think, I mean, it's, got, it's challenging to run and it's got a lot of cooks in the kitchen and you can imagine it's not the easiest thing in the world, but, but there's a principle there about divorcing the process of learning and critical understanding um, from, from the process of, of giving out money and, and making it in the process more participatory to your question, Liz, right? Making it more, more it's, it's a, it's a multi-stakeholder group deciding on the questions that we are asking. So, yeah. Which then opens up the parameters of what is seen as worthy evidence, right? Yes. Or as as yeah. worthy knowledge to inform programming. It's interesting how often in each of your presentations money came up, right? Mm -hmm. So evaluation, is, it's the distinction that you noted at the start, I guess, Andrew, you know, evaluation is seen as a, a box to tick or a, a system, like an, an annoying hurdle you have to keep jumping in order to get the resourcing you need, which is true. Like it's genuinely true in a lot of the contexts that I've written grants. But then also as evaluation as an opportunity to help people to better understand themselves and the work that they're doing, right? Uh, I think that's enough out of me. Would anyone like to um, ask a question? We have a mic here. This is being recorded. So if you have a question, please ask for the mic or go to the mic and feel free to chip in. Go ahead. Are you okay to go to the, do you want to go first? I think that Liz has sort of already half, half asked my question because I think something that keeps um, recurring for me in your comments is that there's an inherent power dynamic here, that people are being asked to do evaluations in order to gain access to resources or because regula regulatory authorities are asking them to do so. Yeah. And that's kind of the, it's the elephant or the dragon in the room, I guess, right? And so when we think about um, truly grassroots or community-oriented evaluation, I, I, I think I'd like to, similarly to ask, how can, we, how can we do that? You know, even just thinking about um, the video about working with our Indigenous people and saying, well, what if the Indigenous people themselves were doing the evaluation, even if it were a funder, for example, who was receiving that evaluation. I'm, I'm curious to hear um, about your thoughts on that kind of decolonized or uh, perhaps um, deregulated uh, evaluation model. The, the, just as a quick little resource that I love, the Ontario Association of Indigenous Friendship Centers has an excellent resource guide for Indigenous communities on how to negotiate with researchers and when to say yes and when to say no about getting involved with research projects, which I often use, and, and, and I think this is kind of what you're, you're talking about. And, and, but in, given where we sit today, the other thing I think is I think universities have a huge role to play in, in sort of being a counterbalance power-wise to saying, no, no, no. Like there's a way to do this evaluation stuff, guys. And if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right, and don't and not and not sort of allow this kind of um, uh, sort of power move to happen in, in, in such an easy way. And and I and I think I think we I think we can do that, right? Because we have that credibility and that deep knowledge of critical approaches to research. There are also, I'm now a panelist because I thought that was such a good question. I'll take only one minute. There are also, I think, ways of, of doing both of the things. So like we're, we're all kind of bridges here, right, as, as scholars or students or practitioners who want to do good in the world. We know that we have to work within -ish the institutional parameters that dictate the terms of our existence here. We also know that those parameters are inherently um, 
exclusionary or damaging or silencing to vast swaths of humanity, right? I think that's pretty generally accepted. Anyway, I feel that way. So what we tr have to figure out to do is how to function within a system that can enable good without allowing it to um, hinder our broader and better urges. So one tiny example, and then I'll, I'll be a moderator again, but um, in my previous role, I did a lot of arts-based work, um, and one of our partnerships was with a group that provides services to a children and youth living with various levels of physical and mental ability. So they would do these music-based workshops. Our research interest was in the impact of musical participation on people's confidence, social cohesion, um, you know, sense of community belonging and so on. Their interest was not in that at all. So I found myself trying to evaluate the program the first year that I supported it, and the kids were like, I don't care what you're asking me. That is not, I want to talk about that really loud drum. I want to talk about how I already knew how to play piano and you thought I didn't, right? So they had like, they were their own musician, thinker, practitioners, and I had forgotten for some reason that of course they should help shape the questions, right? Like, I mean, I knew it, but I didn't do it. So. So from then on, what we did was we would have a huddle at the beginning and partway through and then at the end. And I'd say, listen, part of my job is to talk about what impacts we generated here, what you've learned or not learned, how we did as facilitators, what do you want to learn this time? And so we would kind of co-produce, and this is very small and therefore possible, right? And the, the funders had already given us the money, it was Shirk, so they weren't watching as closely, so it was a different power relationship. But we had a fantastic time, so every time we'd gather the data we needed and we would tell the participants what they had asked us to find out for them. And it was, it was really amazing. And we did that via film because a lot of them had different levels of verbal ability and so on. So they would pick their mode of expression, pick their topics together. And it was, it was like not radical, but a small glimmer, you know? It was a little taste of how you could kind of bottom up it. Um, if I can take a, just a minute on the indigenous question. Mm -hmm. So I can answer directly, Jessica, you might be able to, on Social Ventures Australia, but I'll tell you what I do know, that they are a partner in many indigenous community initiatives um, over a long period of time, um, very familiar with the concepts and best practices around consent and engaging in that kind of way as a partner. Um, the reports they produce are really interesting around qualitative, outcomes and actually stories to reflect those outcomes, which really interesting and thoughtful work that um, I know all the colleagues that I've worked with here in Canada and similar Indigenous-led initiatives are impressed by. And in fact, they I know Indigenous clients who have hired them uh, to do similar work here in Canada. So I guess they pass that test at any rate. On their methodology, I can't say much more. I don't know if you can. I mean, there are some yeah. and it's an evolving thing. Um, yeah. I think that, yeah, social return on investment, there definitely are some critiques and there's um, we're looking at ways that we can maybe build it up and put more power with the communities that they're working with. Um, but I think it's really about, yeah, talking to the community partners first and making sure, like, from the very outset that you're negotiating, okay, like, what are your needs? What do you want to see from this process uh, from the very beginning? And making sure that you're not coming in with your own research objectives necessarily, or at least that they're flexible and adaptable yeah. uh, to change. Well, in fact, they're quite open about the critique around SROI themselves and yeah, I mean, where, where they take it. it. In the <laughs> couple times. Yeah, yeah, so it's like because it's something that I'm considering to use as my own methodology yeah. for my research, um, and he was open to further discussing some of the critiques that are ongoing with SROI. Um, but mainly that you're taking a very Western worldview and applying it in a context that does not necessarily embody that Western worldview, right? Yeah. Yeah, great point. So, <laughs> thank I'm, you. I'm thinking a couple of things as I kind of have listened to this, and one of them is coming from, because I think there's been some really interesting things here said about what you can do and what's possible and the great things that we could do in evaluation going forward. And then I'm also at the same time thinking about the kind of multidisciplinary context in which I work, in which social scientists are quite often brought onto the research team in part to do the communications or to do the impact bit or to do that because you know how to do that kind of stuff. And so they'll quite often have gone and done their research and then they want you to come in and please help us convince farmers to adopt this vaccine that they never wanted in the first place, kind of stuff. And so I'm 
what I'm wanting to say here is that there's, it's partly a cultural thing, and so I think that as social scientists, we tend to have a culture of appreciating evaluation and thinking we can do this better and needing to have this kind of parity between the different actors. But there's also a range of disciplines out there, and I'm probably doing them an injustice because it's not that all natural scientists are like this, it's just that they don't tend to get trained in qualitative research methods and stakeholder interaction and that sort of thing to the degree that we do because we have to when we collect our data. And so my, my caution is that if you do give us this greater freedom to do evaluation, I suspect that there will be some people that will go and do fantastic, exciting evaluation things, but there will also be a cohort of scientists who will go, right, freedom, well, let's just spend 10 minutes on this and then move on to what we really want to do. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, with greater freedom comes greater responsibility, and so there is a reason that we have some of these kind of checks and balances yeah. in place. We have about five minutes left. Does anyone else have a question, comment? It's only five minutes now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Actually, I, I hope it'll be quick. And um, and I, I'm a little bit um, I talk about the, the program. Mary talk about the Memory program, uh, which is I, I do research. And uh, a few years back, and um, I was in a workshop, and uh, the uh, government person approached me and said, Oh, we government invest one next semicolon and uh, you know funding, and we need to get a re evaluation report. Do you have any like data say, oh, I did a planning how many trees and some other things and what the effects are? Mm -hmm. I said, I do have some data, but I'm not going to give to you. The reason is very simple. My research is very specific. And do you guys work and maybe some authority? I said, you guys programs five years. So why don't you engage me five years ago? Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, we did not think about that and something like that. Anyway, they get things done. My question basically is two things. One is that and for the program evaluation or some social program, and are there any way, and or I guess it's difficult to engage this evaluation from the beginning at the outset. Mm -hmm. So how many things people are doing? Second thing, and I mentioned a very good point, is that and all this evaluation, yes, has a framework, probably need a uh, social scientist or scientist all together, good quality of quantitative things. And it's not just for evaluation's sake, and maybe have lots of science, social science, innovation, or something can be done. So, sorry. This is quick. Thanks. Anyone want to take part one or two of that question? What can we do at the, to get it at the beginning? I, I, to be fair, I think it's federal governments uh, here in Canada, and I think funders more generally, I think are quite good at the beginning of a funding relationship of raising the question and saying, look, hey, valuation's got to be part of this. We want to know your, your strategy. So I think it is getting talked about at the early stages. But sometimes, and I don't know, I don't know in these particular cases, but in, in my experience, sometimes the nature of that conversation at the beginning is what's the outcome you're going to achieve and how are you going to measure it? And that's as far as it goes. And, and I think part of what we've been recommending in our practice is we also need to know why are you asking those things? What are you going to do differently once you have the answers to them? How are they going to help us as a funder do things differently? And let, let us tell you why we're doing this project and what we hope to learn from it. I remember working with one grantor that had over the last several years given out five grants to five different nonprofits who were all trying to work in schools. Every one of their evaluation reports came back saying, you know what, it's harder to get into schools than we thought it was going to be and it took us a long time and yet that grantor was sitting there with those five evaluation reports somewhere in a file and still giving out grants to more nonprofits to do the same thing like like they hadn't learned it right they hadn't said you should stop doing that guys or, or if you're going to give money you should be giving it to groups that have done the infrastructure to get into schools and so I think the conversations at the beginning of the relationship need to go deeper into the learning and the action and not just stop at the measurement and one thing I'll say is that, I guess in my experience, there's really two kinds of funders. There's funders who are partners, who are interested in a collective learning uh, as partners and supporting that, which also means learning from your mistakes collectively, um, challenges, successes. And then there's funders where there's a power differential, which we've referred to, where it's uh, there's only room for perfect ex execution of planned activities, programs, and initiatives, and not that spirit of collective learning in the room. And, and so they're different, and kind of wearing a different lens, knowing what kind of funder you're working with, navigating through that, um, because they're, they're different and they're, the outcomes are applied differently, at least in my experience. Yeah. 
So Mary has brought us to our cl the close of our official time together, so I want to thank the panelists for your brilliant contributions. It was very easy to moderate you because you didn't need me, so that was perfect <laughs> for me. Um, thanks to everyone for coming, and please do help yourselves to snacks and refreshments before you go. There's Byron's put on a beautiful spread, so eat it up. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.